The Hold Up game is a variation of the Ultimatum game that we have already seen. In this game, just like in the Ultimatum game, player one can uh, choose to split uh, fairly or greedily, and player two can choose to accept or reject. However, in this variation of the Ultimatum game, player two first gets to make a choice that determines the possible payoff to both players. So you can imagine a scenario such as uh, General Motors and one of its suppliers. General Motors is going to be player one and um, it can offer to be fair or greedy um, and the supplier can either take that or uh, break up the relationship uh, which would be cost costly to both of them. However, before um, this game takes place, the supplier can choose to make an investment into some assets that would be specific to the relationship. So they could invest very heavily and with a high investment they could uh, create uh, maybe some machinery or design or invest in some way into the relationship that will make it really valuable to both of them and therefore the payoffs that would be possible a total of 18 would be higher. This is costly for player 2 however so the cost is 2. Alternatively player 2 could invest low and that means uh, maybe using assets that are maybe a little more generic and less specific to the relationship between GM and that supplier and that means the payoff that they can achieve together uh, is a total of 14 only, not 18 but it's also less costly, it only costs 1 for player 2. So player 2 makes the investment, could be high, could be low and then player 1, GM, once that investment is made is really in a, a very good position uh, because now that player 2 has made the investment um, they really get to dictate the terms and could offer fair terms or more greedy terms which uh, player 2 then uh, can accept or reject. So uh, let's try to solve this game using backward induction. First of all that means we start at the end. Uh, player 2 at the very end would choose to accept even a greedy offer because the negative 1 that it would lead to would still be better than the negative 2. So remember they are splitting 18. This is the case where uh, player 2 makes a high investment. So they are splitting 18. Uh, with the greedy offer player 1 keeps 17 and gives 1 to player 2. With the cost of 2 that leaves negative 1 in the end for player 2. But that's still better than the negative 2 that player 2 would incur um, by rejecting the offer, which means breaking up the relationship and getting a payoff of zero, um, and then still having the cost of two. That's how we get the negative two. Okay, well, uh, what about after a fair offer? Player two would, of course, accept that. Uh, the, the seven would be better than the negative two that player two could get by rejecting it. Of course, um, that means player 1 will choose to give the greedy offer because the 17 for player 1 would be better than the 9 um, if he were to give a fair offer instead. So now we know what happens after player 2 chooses a high uh, level of investment. Player 1 would give a greedy offer and player 2 would accept that offer. What happens on the other branch after, branch after a low investment? Well, player 2 would accept the offer even if it were greedy there too because 0 would be better than the negative one and uh, would still accept a fair offer of course which means player one would choose to give the greedy offer um, on that branch as well. So now we get to the beginning where player two gets to make a choice as to uh, the level of investment and if player two were to uh, invest low that would lead to a payoff of uh, zero for player two but investing high would lead to a negative payoff a minus one which means player two will choose to invest low and this demonstrates the phenomenon whereby uh, player one is basically holding up uh, player two is getting held up by uh, player one so uh, we now know how to describe a game uh, that is a normal form game with simultaneous moves and we know how to describe a game that's an extensive form game that has a temporal aspect and where we can also show the order of moves and uh, um, uh, how uh, players can make their strategies dependent on uh, previous moves in the game. Sometimes um, it's interesting to see what happens if you convert a normal form game into an extensive form game. So what happens if in a normal form game such as this one, uh, one player can somehow manage to make a move before the other player. In other words, 
introduce a temporal structure into the game. Um, in the original uh, game, uh, uh, duopoly game that uh, we are looking at right now, remember the payoffs were um, 1600 for each if they both produce a high volume of output, 40 gallons, and um, 1800 each if they produce a lower volume of output, 30 gallons. Uh, but then, of course, if one of them deviates from that 30-gallon uh, output level while the other stays with it, then the person who deviates, let's say Jack, gets a really good profit, while the person who doesn't, in this case Jill, gets a worse profit. So, if you remember in this game, the equilibrium was uh, 40 gallons and 40 gallons, leading to a profit of 1,600 for each. And that's the Nash equilibrium. It's also called the Cournot equilibrium. Uh, in this game because um, it was um, in the context of uh, the duopoly the duopoly game that Cournot solved this game first even before there was game theory and for that reason we call it a Cournot equilibrium uh, even though it's just a regular Nash equilibrium so um, what happens if Jack somehow finds a way to move first and therefore Jill uh, will be reacting to Jack's first move. Well to ask that question let's first simplify this game a little bit by dividing all payoffs by a hundred. So this is really the same game except payoffs are expressed in hundreds of dollars. The equilibrium is of course still 1616, the Cournot or Nash equilibrium. Now let's expand the game a little bit. Um, and add another strategy for each player. Notice that this game includes the previous game, so uh, the choices of 30 and 40 are available to Jack and also to Jill. And uh, the lower right corner of this game, that 2x2 two two is just the original game that we have already seen. But now we have 50 as an option for both Jill and Jack. Uh, that's an even higher level of output. So if you solve this game, um, look for the Nash equilibrium, you will see that uh, 1616 is still the Nash equilibrium or Cournot equilibrium of this game. Let's take this game now and transform it into an extensive form game by having Jack move first. So that means Jack first gets to decide whether to choose a level of output of 50, 40 or 30. And after each choice, Jill can choose 50, 40, or 30. So uh, what will be the sub-game perfect equilibrium of this game? Well, remember we start at the end. So let's go back from the terminal nodes and uh, see what Jill's optimal choices would be. Um, at this node, Jill would choose 30 because the payoff of 14 is higher than the 12 or the 10 that she could get by choosing 40 or 50. After Jack chooses 40, Jill would choose 40 also. Uh, the payoff of 16 would be higher than the 15 or 14 that she could otherwise get. And if Jack were to choose 30, Jill would react to that by choosing 40 again uh, for a payoff of 20 that would be higher than the payoff she could get by choosing 30 or 50. Jack, knowing that, uh, having thought through that, uh, now decides how much to produce. For 50, he would get a payoff of 18. After 40, he would get a payoff of 16. And for choosing 30, he'd get a payoff of 15, which means he's going to choose an output level of 50. So, in the subgame perfect equilibrium, Jack produces 50 gallons of water and Jill produces 30. And Jack gets a profit of 18 or 1800 and Jill 14 or 1400. And that outcome is called the Stackelberg outcome of this game. Uh, compare that with the Cournot outcome, which we have already seen. And you can see that um, Jack has a higher profit in the Stackelberg outcome uh, than in the Cournot outcome, and Jill has a lower profit. What that shows us is that there is a first mover advantage in this game. So we have seen that if we convert the duopoly game into an extensive form game uh, and one of the players is able to move first, that player has an advantage in the equilibrium, that player will have a higher payoff and that's called the first mover advantage.